So, hey, guys, as I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to talk about some uh, repatriation things or people who are basically taking technology and using it in optimized ways, which is something we don't see a lot out there in terms of everybody moving into AW, uh, moving into AI and uh, moving to cloud only solutions, things like that. And there's a lot of this going on. And, you know, in my tenure and working in the big consulting realm, I did a lot of, you know, relooking at uh uh, in different technologies and normalizing it. In other words, in some instances, moving it back to on-prem systems or even moving it to other systems are going to be more cost optimized what we're looking to do. And I think that's going to be key uh, in our survivability moving forward with this technology. So joining me today is a person with that story. It's going to be S Sebastian uh, Montragon. And why don't you give us a uh, introduction to yourself, Sebastian, who you work for, you know, you work for yourself. Tell us about your company, services you offer, and then we'll get into the uh, uh, experience that you have. Sure, David. So thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me to your podcast. I was really flattered uh, of receiving the invitation. So, well, uh, uh, you introduced my name already. My name is Sebastian. I'm the CEO of Particular Tech. We help businesses to figure out if AI is right for them. Um, if it is, we help them to develop, consult, or do research alongside with them for the implementation. Uh, with the companies we work with, pretty much, uh, we don't have a focus niche, to be honest. Uh, we focus more on the problem and the size of the company. So we have worked with companies from uh, retail, manufacturing, well, healthcare as well, and a couple of more. Got it. And so talking about the use case that I read on LinkedIn, which caused me to reach out to you, you know, what was kind of the business event that triggered you know, that use of uh, technology in a certain way? And how was the decision-making process around it? In other words, tell us what was in your head and how you came to these decisions. <laughs> All right, yeah. That was a, a pretty chaotic past. Uh, well, uh, the case, uh, it declines a uh, Swiss uh, health company. They have probably like uh, two or three hospitals that are considered uh, on the premium sector uh, on the Swiss market. And... Uh, uh, our decision to move uh, out of AWS and cloud providers was uh, driven mostly by two things. Uh, the first one was, of course, the bill. The bill was getting high really, really fast. Uh, when you were summoning like storage, already the resources you were uh, using for to run their models and, and all these things that, that are required for that. Uh, and the second thing that also plays a huge role, uh, that played a huge role for that, was mostly the legislation on the Swiss uh, government. So it's a health company. And when we're talking about the AI, everyone nowadays and all the governments are trying to find the best way to uh, somehow make sure that the data will not be used for some uh, shady purposes. So that was the this, this two main uh, factors for that. So it was cost and security. Is that a good way to sum it up? In other words, there was uh, two driving factors there, the compliance and to Swiss law uh, and the ability to protect, protect personally identifiable information, in this case, health data, which is very sensitive, and also the ability to kind of shave some money and uh, optimize an architecture that's going to be better fit for the value of the business. Is that a good way to sum it up? Yeah, I, if, if we could like, put it in one sentence, I would just say like cost saving and security. That's it. You know what? I can't. I mean, that's fundamentally what I'm seeing in there. People are moving uh, away from the cloud into other platforms. It could be neo clouds. It could, it could be other public cloud platforms. But you know, sovereign cloud environments, basically, alternatives to the hyperscalers out there: Amazon, uh, Google, and Microsoft. Um, mainly because cost, and that's obviously they're pressed and they're paying you know three times as much as they thought they'd be paying in the cloud. And that's kind of something I wrote about in my book. And then the security stuff, which people have a tendency to don't think about. And you think about Europe and, you know, it's moving to sovereign based, you know, digital sovereignty and things like that. That's driving a lot of these repatriations and replatforming things going on more so than you think. And I think we're going to see an acceleration of this. And also we're going to see picking platforms for our AI new stuff, you know, the cool AI stuff we're bringing into the business. That's not necessarily going to be on the hyperscalers because of cost sensitivity and because of compliance issues. So when you evaluated costs, what specific cloud expenses like data egress, storage fees, managed services, over provisioned instances. So what stood out as the biggest contributors to your overall bill before migration? So in other words, where, where were you uh, in the existing as is state uh, in terms of uh, the security and the cost that you're paying? And then where did you get to with the 2B state when you moved to the new environments? 
All right. So I don't really remember the the exact numbers, to, to be honest with you, but I'm going to try to give a rough. So uh, when we were on AWS, when the client was on AWS, uh, their bill was probably around 40000 per month. Uh, and in, time, uh, in terms of resources, I'm not really sure how much of that was uh, storage and, and, now, and now that like really well split it. But we had uh, at that time an average of 2,000 scans per month, which in AI it's a lot. So we were using uh, OCR. Um, that's pretty heavy. I mean, you need really, really good GPUs to run this type of things. Um, if, if I'm not mistaken, the majority of things that, the, or the majority of that bill was basically resources. So storage and everything was summing up, of course, because at the end of the day, what the system was doing, it was storaging all the images uh, as well from the patient. So doctors anytime would be able to go back and see the sort of logs of what AI suggested and why, right? So they will also be able to pretty much have all the history of, of, of that. That's awesome. I mean, I'm hearing similar kind of gains that are being made out there right now. Um, so... Can you walk us through the business case and what assumptions, models, and financial metrics you use to compare the cloud version with some of the on-prem, are your alternatives that you're moving into, just looking at the cost aspect of it? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, if we talk about cost, uh, we, we indeed analyze together with them, uh, first of all, different cloud providers. So we look at uh, AWS, Oracle, Microsoft, Google, and we were like, well, like, the, the, even if the, the price changed a lot, uh, there is still this factor when we talk about uh, regulation and law compliance. Um, that was as well uh, a number that we as technical people were, like we don't have the need to count for that, but they still were running for that. So they needed to have a lot of uh, people on their payroll or hire external attorneys to be able to make sure that those things were in place, all right? And, and on top of that, they also needed the money to make sure that they were able to pay for the regulators. So, well, not regulators, but uh, basically companies who are able to go and verify that all the systems are uh, as they are supposed to be. Yeah, I think I'm seeing, um, you know, many people going through similar kind of operations. You seem to be, um, you know, uh, finding out what other people have found out, including many, you know, global 2000 companies out there. So from a technical and operational perspective, what were the most challenging parts of actually uh, executing the migration off the cloud? And uh, how did the migrate, uh, how did you migrate risks and downtime? How would you mitigate risks and downtime? Excuse me. All right. Well, uh, that's actually downtime was one of the most challenging risk. So uh, as I said, you like, well, we explore different, uh, uh, variants before deciding to move on cloud. Um, there were basically two main uh, points that we say to them, like, if you have those, uh, it's better to go on-premise. So uh, first of all, was to have a backup of energy. And well, they were uh, a hospital, so they indeed uh, had this backup on, on energy. And second of all, to have a team that was able to take care of this uh, infrastructure in the long term. Right? So we were able to set it up make sure that everything was working, but we were not going to be there 24 seven until that something goes wrong. Um, also something very important was the monitoring of the system. So with AWS and any other platform, it's really easy to know when your uh, platform is down, there is a bug or it's pretty easy to keep track of all that. But uh, on this case, we were uh, the ones who were supposed to build everything. We needed to make sure that uh, we build this right because let's say that you are a doctor and you're trying to analyze or see what the AI was doing and you receive an error, like, I don't know, I don't know, 404, 401, whatever error you, you might have. Um, the doctor will not know anything about it, right? So it's like useless information for them. So you know, we made sure that the information was arriving to the right people, including us. So uh, we, we made some sort of double layer. So first their team was notified, uh, then their person in charge of the technology and then us to make sure that if there was a problem, uh, we go at any stage of these, uh, 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 let's call it, um, stairs, we will have it solved. That's good. So you kind of had a hierarchy of people who were uh, assisting you and kind of getting around kind of any obstacles you ran into. Is that a good way to describe it? Yes, yeah, I, that's definitely a really good way. 
Yeah. And I think that's, that's important because you got to remember the stakeholders have to be involved in this. We have to have some, some decision support and getting as many people involved, I think is a good idea. Not necessarily we're trying to waste their time, but they're going to be impacted by this migration. They should understand what's going on and assist in making decisions and even removing obstacles for you. And I think the, you know, the biggest thing that I found out when I did migrations is I made a lot of friends in the companies I went to. So I could get problems solved. I could figure out how to get equipment. I could figure out how to get network access, figure out how to get access to, mm -hmm. you know, some of the core security systems, you know, versus 20 meetings to get there. And all those things were preset. And by the time I did the migration, it was a fairly easy thing to execute. And if I had a problem, I could just call somebody and they could get around or solve the issue for me. So so looking at the numbers now, how do you realize, excuse me, how do the realized cost savings and performance outcomes compare with your initial expectations? In other words, when you looked at the past state and then you figured out where you're going to get to, you, you were expecting some good things to occur and they didn't occur and some bad things to occur and they didn't occur. So what was surprising to you when you went through the migration based on your expectations going into it? All right. So uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, at that time when we were in AWS, they were running uh, around 200,000 monthly scans monthly, but nowadays they're running around 50,000 per day, if I'm not mistaken, or roughly uh, that number. So the increase is, is quite big. Um, so that, that's the first thing, uh, but it's still like the system we set up for them is able to run with it because, well, you, you don't have uh, a bunch of like these 50,000 requests on one second, but they are. Uh, subsequent to to each and on another, um, something that well, of course the year is not over, so we are not able to say like, all right, we definitely reached the number we were aiming for. Uh, we reached initially for a ninety five percent reduction or ninety percent reduction. Uh, of course, because of the increase, uh, we are at the moment if we go as we are around sixty percent, sixty percent, sixty five percent improvement on cost. And something that at least was even better than we expected was the support. So as I like we set up this escalation system uh, for them and we accounted for around 20 hours uh, on a monthly basis. And nowadays we are probably like eight hours, five hours. Wow. Month. Wow, that's great progress. I mean, you guys really kind of knocked it out of the park. So as we wrap up, what key lessons or advice would you share with other organizations watching this who are questioning their current cloud spend and considering repatriation or a different cloud strategy or basically moving to other platforms, cloud or not? All right. I think uh, the most important thing is to understand if your business has like these sort of spikes of usage. So if that's the case, uh, definitely cloud will be the solution. You will have pretty much unlimited resources, we can we can say that. Um, but if you have a constant usage and you know what it is, it will be useful to reconsider the numbers, all right? So that's at least what we did for this client. And when they already have like this type of constant um, uh, usage and you're able to uh, measure that, at least with the AI, it's really easy to measure the amount of resources a model will use. It's, it's pretty easy to keep track of that. And I, I think it more, makes more sense to, to have it in-house but always, uh, on-premise is not religion. So it, it's always better to, to have either a hybrid option or to explore either what works best for your use case. So uh, as we wrap up, uh, let's look at, you know, tell us where people can reach out and find you if they want to engage your company, they want to figure out, uh, ask you questions, uh, things like that. What's best to reach out? To, how the, what's the best way to reach out to you? Uh, well, to me personally, uh, they can reach uh, out to me by LinkedIn. Uh, well, name Sebastian Mondragon, or through email, uh, Sebastian at particular.tech. Great. And I'll have those in the description below. And uh, you can go ahead and reach out, re reach out to him because I tell you what, um, we have a lot of these uh, case studies that are starting to emerge out there, but there's not a lot out there that where people are really to, looking to help and explore and expand and, you know, talk about this in kind of a, you know, intellectual perspective in terms of what we're doing here and why we're moving in this place. And I think it's more, it's not a binary thing. In other words, it's not directly giving up on cloud and moving to the non-cloud platforms or giving up on the big hyperscalers and moving to the non-hyperscaler platform. This is about normalization and putting practical and logical architectures that are really going to, as we always say, return the most value to the business. So 
thank you very much, Sebastian, for coming and sharing this. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the story as it evolves, and uh, maybe we can invite you again sometime. Amazing. Thanks so much for the invitation again. I really appreciate it.